The origin of the moon's thin atmosphere has been determined. Since the 1980s, astronomers have observed a very thin layer of atoms near the moon's surface. This thin atmosphere is likely the product of some kind of cosmic weathering. However, scientists have not been able to determine the mechanism responsible for its formation. Until now. In a new study, they have identified the process that formed the moon's atmosphere and continues to sustain it. The moon is considered to have no atmosphere, although in fact it does have an extremely weak gas envelope, but it is so thin that it could almost be considered non-existent. However, astronomers have observed an increased presence of atoms in its vicinity, compared to space. This atmosphere is tiny compared to Earth, for example. Its total mass is estimated to be no more than 10 tons. It consists mainly of helium, hydrogen, neon, and argon, with traces of methane, ammonia, and carbon dioxide, and requires constant replenishment due to the high rate of loss of gases into space. In a study published in the journal Science Advances, a team of scientists from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology MIT, and the University of Chicago determined that meteorite impacts are responsible for most of the atmosphere on the moon. The team of researchers reached this conclusion by analyzing samples of regolith, or lunar soil, brought to Earth during the Apollo missions. According to the findings, during its 4.5 billion year history, the moon was initially bombarded by large meteorites, and later by small particles of debris hurtling through the solar system. The impacts of tiny meteorites on the regolith cause some of the atoms in the ground to evaporate. They also cause the regolith to rise above the surface of the moon. Some atoms are thrown into space, others remain suspended above the moon, creating its extremely thin atmosphere. It is constantly replenished because meteorites constantly hit the moon's surface. They also hit the Earth, but only the largest ones reach the surface. Tiny particles simply burn in the Earth's thick atmosphere. Scientists have discovered that the evaporation of material from the regolith by meteorite impacts is the main process by which the moon created and maintains its extremely thin atmosphere. We provide a definitive answer that the evaporation of some atoms from the regolith by meteorite impacts is the dominant process that creates the moon's atmosphere, says lead author Nicole Nye of MIT. The moon is almost 4.5 billion years old, and its surface has been constantly bombarded by meteorites over that time. We show that the thin atmosphere is still present because it is constantly being replenished by small impacts all over the moon, she adds. In 2013, NASA sent an orbiter around the moon to conduct detailed atmospheric reconnaissance. The Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer Lady, was designed to gather information about the moon's thin atmosphere surface conditions, and any environmental influences on lunar dust. The mission was designed to determine the origin of the moon's atmosphere. Scientists had hoped that remote measurements of the composition of the regolith and atmosphere could correlate with certain space weathering processes that could explain how our natural satellite's atmosphere formed. Scientists suspect that two space weathering processes play a role in shaping its thin atmosphere, the aforementioned evaporation of material from the regolith by micrometeor impacts, and a phenomenon involving the solar wind that researchers call ion sputtering. The solar wind carries energetic particles from the sun. When these particles hit the moon's surface, they cause atoms to break off from the regolith and turn into a gas. The analyses showed that during meteor showers, you see more atoms in the moon's atmosphere, which means that these impacts have an effect. 
but they also showed that when the moon is shielded from the sun, there are also changes in its atmosphere, which means that the sun has an effect, Nices. To further determine the origin of the lunar atmosphere, Nye looked at regolith samples collected during the Apollo missions. He and his colleagues obtained 10 samples of lunar soil, each weighing about 100 milligrams. First, the researchers isolated two elements from each sample, potassium and rubidium. Both are volatile, meaning they evaporate easily from impacts and ion sputtering. Each element comes in several isotopes. An isotope is a form of the same element that has the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons. The team reasoned that if the moon's atmosphere was made up of atoms that evaporated and rose to the surface, the lighter isotopes of those atoms should have been lifted more easily, while the heavier ones would likely have settled back into the regolith. The scientists reasoned that the evaporation of material from impacts and ion sputtering should have resulted in different isotope ratios in the lunar soil. The specific ratio of light to heavy isotopes that remain in the regolith, both for potassium and rubidium, should reveal the main process contributing to the formation of the atmosphere on the moon. Analyzing samples brought back to Earth from the Apollo missions, they found that the regolith contained mainly heavier isotopes of potassium and rubidium. The scientists were able to determine the ratio of heavy to light isotopes of both elements. They determined that evaporation of material from the regolith by micrometeorites impacts is most likely the dominant process for the formation and maintenance of the thin atmosphere on the moon. In the case of impact evaporation, most of the atoms would remain in the atmosphere of the moon, whereas in the case of ion sputtering, many atoms would be ejected into space. Thanks to our study, we can now quantify the role of both processes to say that the relative contribution of evaporation compared to ion sputtering is about 70 to 30, nice as. In other words, 70%. The moon's atmosphere is a product of meteorite impacts, and the remaining 30% is a consequence of the action of the solar wind. New wood-based material can absorb 99.3% of light. The material developed by scientists from the University of British Columbia absorbs over 99% of the light that falls on it. Xylon, as the researchers named their super black material, can increase the efficiency of solar cells or reduce unwanted light reflections and improve transparency in telescopes. Thanks to an accidental discovery, scientists from the University of British Columbia have created a new, super black material that absorbs almost all the light that falls on it. Cylon can be used in solar cells, precision optical devices or luxury consumer items such as watches. The description of the discovery was published in the journal Advanced Sustainable Systems. Philip Evans and Kenny Cheng from the University of British Columbia in Canada, UBC, conducted research on hydrophobic technologies for wood. In one of their experiments, they used high-energy plasma. The plasma caused the ends of wooden surfaces cut with it to become extremely black. The researchers sent the samples to their colleagues at Texas A&M University. Tests at the lab there confirmed that the material reflected less than 1% of visible light, absorbing almost all of the light that fell on it. This accidental discovery changed the direction of the research. The UBC scientists decided to focus on designing super black materials, contributing to a new approach to the search for the darkest materials on Earth. The researchers named their material Xylon. Nyx is the Greek goddess of the night, and Xylon is the Greek word for wood. The ultra black material can absorb more than 99% of the light that falls on it much more than ordinary black paint, which absorbs about 97.5% of light, 
Evans explained. Ceylon is based on linden wood, a tree common in North America, but the researchers say that other types of wood can be used to make it. They emphasize that it is the structure of the material, created after the wood is plasma treated, that prevents light from escaping. The application of plasma changes the tiny structures on the wood surface, introducing pits that help capture light and minimize any reflections. But in Cylon, which absorbs 99.3% of light, isn't the blackest material in the world. In 2019, researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology developed a material that absorbs a whopping 99.995% of light. The super black materials could find applications in a variety of fields. In astronomy, ultra black coatings on devices could help reduce light scattering and improve image clarity. Super black coatings could also boost the efficiency of solar cells. The super black materials applied to jewelry could also gain consumer recognition such deep blacks create striking visual effects by providing a sharp contrast to bright colors nearby. The researchers have even developed prototypes of commercial products using their super black wood. They are currently focusing on watches but they plan to explore other commercial applications in the future. Cylon could replace expensive and rare black woods like ebony and rosewood for watch faces. It can also be used in jewelry as a replacement for the black gemstone onyx. Cylon's composition combines the advantages of natural materials with unique structural features, making it lightweight, stiff and easy to cut into complex shapes, admitted Evans. The authors of the publication now plan to launch a startup, Xylon Corporation of Canada, to scale up the materials applications. They intend to work with jewelers, artists, and designers. They also plan to develop a commercial-scale plasma reactor to mass-produce the super black wood. Cylon can be made from durable and renewable materials commonly found in North America and Europe, leading to new uses for wood, noted Evans. Africa is slowly breaking up. Scientists predict the creation of a new ocean. We are perfectly aware that the continents on Earth are constantly moving, a drastic manifestation of which is, for example, earthquakes. It would certainly be difficult for us to recognize the arrangement of the continents on our planet after hundreds of millions of years. And these changes are taking place even now. This applies to Africa, for example, which, as researchers point out, is slowly falling apart. Scientists claim that Africa is breaking up into two parts, which will ultimately lead to the creation of a new ocean. Although this process will take millions of years, as scientists argue, it will separate the current areas of Somalia, parts of Kenya, Ethiopia, and Tanzania from the rest of the continent. When observing the world around us and the continents existing on Earth, we should always bear in mind that what we see, what the maps we use show, is relatively new in relation to the entire time of the Earth's existence and has existed for a relatively short time. The surface of the Earth is constantly changing. Only the human eye is unable to see this directly. Because, in turn, it happens relatively slowly. Such processes take millions of years. It is not without reason that the continents of the Earth are sometimes compared to pieces of a puzzle. Just look at their shape. For example, the western coast of Africa and the eastern coast of South America seem to fit together very well. This is due to the fact that millions of years ago they actually touched in this very place. However, their separation occurred about 138 million years ago. In the context of the movement of continents on Earth, something significant is already happening to Africa, 
which will irreversibly change its shape and appearance. Of significant importance here is the Great East African Rift Valley, a tectonic trench that is part of the Great African Rift Valley. It runs through many countries, such as Ethiopia, Kenya, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Zambia, Tanzania, Malawi, and Mozambique. In 2018, the world was circulated by film footage and photos showing a huge crack that occurred in Kenya. Even then, there were voices that Africa was falling apart before our eyes. However, while this event was in fact connected to the aforementioned rift system, a rift is a type of tectonic trench that extends over large distances, it cannot be unequivocally considered tangible evidence of the division of Africa. However, it is estimated that this rift has been involved in the processes taking place in Africa for about 25 million years. On the other hand, the tectonic movements taking place along the East African system are causing the African plate to gradually split into two parts, and the Somali and Nubian plates are gradually starting to move away from each other. This is a very slow process movement occurs at a speed of millimeters per year. However, this means that over the next millions of years Africa will be torn into two parts, between which a new ocean will probably be created. It is estimated that these changes will take a more drastic form in about 5 to 10 million years, and it is during this period that a new body of water will most likely be created.